Hello colleagues. I hope you can hear me and see me. Welcome to our March edition of Experiences in Digital Learning. It's lovely to have you here with us. We've got a very uh, exciting and interesting panel discussion today that I hope you'll be able to engage with and, and join in with. The Experiences in Digital Learning series, which has been running since last July on a pretty much monthly basis, has really given us a chance to explore a range of thoughts, ideas, innovations and challenges in this new world we occupy. Strangely, within the UK, we're sort of a year since we went into lockdown and we're still in lockdown. So it's for us, it's been a whole year of considerable online experience and engagement. Uh, for me, pretty much all from my spare bedroom, which has been an interesting experience. It's a very small space to be working in, but it's been very exciting and it's been particularly exciting knowing that our audience has joined us for many of these uh, workshops. So thank you very much for many of these webinars. Thank you very much for joining us. So today, experiences in digital learning it's going to be incredibly important to grapple with some of the challenges we know that we've all encountered in terms of ensuring that our students and ourselves are really able to engage with us are really getting the very best opportunities and the best experiences that they possibly can in these rather strange times so i'm delighted to have a panel with me who are going to be able to talk to you and share with you some ideas and we hope there'll be a very active discussion as there has been in the question and answer panel. We're looking at approaches to inclusive online practice and I think the first thing to say of course is that here are a variety of conversations around approaches. There are no fixed answers the questions are possibly infinite around inclusivity in the online space as they are in the face to face space. But I do think today we'll have an opportunity to really dig in some depth into the question of how we develop an online learning experience that is as inclusive as it possibly can, but also power is going to be very important in this conversation whose power and whose empowerment can we explore? So we have a panel and I'm just going to ask Andrew to pop the slide forward so that we can talk a little bit about our panel today. So Werner is joining us to have a look at thinking about universal design for learning, a very important area um, and I think it will set the scenes for our following two speakers. So Werner is joining us from Ravensbourne University in London and um, lots and lots of experience. And those who know Werner, she's extremely active in, in making us all think very carefully about what we're doing and sharing ideas very, very creatively. So I'm looking forward to, to her input. Next slide, please, Andrew. Maha joins us from the American University in Cairo. And just to say Maha doesn't have an absolutely brilliant connection today. Um, so what we'll do, we, we won't um, always be able to see Maha on screen, but she will be joining us on screen as much as possible. So equity and dialogue, I think that it's going to be a fascinating um, participatory experience that Maha will bring us. Next slide, please. And we've got Elle who's joining us from Glasgow um, and picking up on some really important issues around neurodiversity uh, and inclusive learning and teaching online. So overall, I think this is going to be a particularly exciting and interesting and stretching event for all of us. So I'm going to stop talking and hand over, if I may, to Verna. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for introducing me. Very kind of you to uh, invite me to this event. So I'm very nice to have my colleagues here as well. So um, 
I'm going to um, just talk for a couple of minutes and then maybe we just uh, we, we go to the slides. So obviously it's March 2021. <laughs> so we have had um, one year of pandemic pedagogy. Um, I think we are all experiencing pandemic fatigue. There's no doubt about that, if not worse. And um, this word, the destruction, which from the Latin is a distrahere, which means to be dragged or pulled. I think we very much feel this, um, you know, being pulled in different directions. And of course, our students feel the same. So at this time, to be honest, more than ever, um, inclusive um, teaching and learning, inclusive learning design have to be very high in our agenda, possibly the top. So um, what can we do? How can we intentionally design learning and then evaluate that learning so that our students have the best chance uh, in these uh, circumstances as well? Um, well, I'm going to use a metaphor. Um, actually, now the surprise is <laughs> a little bit spoiled because you've already seen the, the, the image there. The metaphor I'm going to use is a game changer invention which is the rear view mirror. So why is it a game changer invention? Because we don't have an eye on the back of our heads uh, right now and all the time, our vision of the world is, is what's happening ahead. We can't really see at the same time what's happening behind unless we have a rear view mirror because it's a bit like an eye suspended there which allows us while we are traveling, while we're moving forward on a journey, at a glance, we can check what's happening behind. So this was totally revolutionary when it, it, uh, it started being employed. And it's now a universal use. And in fact, there's not just one, but there are three mirrors to, to check what's happening behind when you drive. You've got one in the cubicle and then you've got the two side mirrors. So this is a metaphor I wanted to use for the three principles of universal design for learning. Three mirrors, and three principles. But because I don't want to assume we are all totally familiar with these principles, I'm going to briefly review the UDL principles. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So UDL is a um, framework which is based, or an approach if you prefer, is based on a brain science. Um, how do our, How is our brain wired? How does it work? So there are three networks. Um, which everybody has. Of course, then there is variety because of our lived experiences, our genetic makeup, um, but this is how our, our brains work, that we do have these three net networks, rec recognition learning, and then strategic learning and effective learning. From these three come the three principles of UDL, which are representation, action and expression and engagement. But what do they mean? Well, basically they refer to different aspects, let's call them, of, of teaching and learning. So for example, representation is about the what of learning. In other words, for example, the input, the course content, what we're trying to um, teach <laughs> or what we would like the students to learn in terms of the subject, let's call it. So the question then, if we want to design um, learning intentionally in an inclusive way, the question is how flexible is this input, the what of learning? What choices, what options do students have? In the past pre-pandemic, perhaps it was very text-based. Um, lots of articles or books, things to read for the students. What about now? Have we gone to the other extreme and it's all videos, videos, videos? Or have we found a balance or can we find a balance? And can we provide choice to the students? Perhaps there is a video or an article. So this is one aspect. The other one is action and expression. This is um, what our brains do then with that, call it, let's call it input, the output. So what outputs or what assessment, for example, do we expect students um, to do uh, to evidence perhaps their learning? So this is the how of learning. So the question we can ask is how flexible um, is the, our assessment regime? What options are there? What are we asking the students to do? Do they have any choice there? So 
something to think about to be able to design learning um, in, in an intentional inclusive way. The third one is engagement, which is so important today. We just can't underestimate it because the why of learning, because now we don't see students um, in person. Uh, most of us, I think we're just teaching remotely. And so how do we engage students and keep them motivated so that they want to learn? So the, the why? of learning. Again, what options and choices do we have? So this is the UDL, it's a, you know, really in a nutshell. This is what UDL is about, this approach to um, learning design, which provides variety, flexibility, choice to the students. So obviously this should really be used at um, design point. So when we're starting on the journey to plan a course. However, right now, I think for most of us, we are in the middle of our teaching. So how can we use this uh, framework instead of um, the design phase for the evaluation phase to actually check and get feedback from our students about our learning design? Well, this is where it joins the previous slide of the three um, sort of rear and side mirrors. So we can use this framework to look back to look what's happened so far on our journey, let's say in our course or um, program, depending on the level we're teaching at. And if we can have the next slide, so just to emphasize, I've actually written it in a slide that the three rear or side mirrors are a metaphor for the three UDL principles. These principles can be used as a lens to, um, against which to evaluate how inclusive our learning design is. So the three mirrors provide three perspectives. Likewise, the three principles provide three perspectives. Um, can we have the next slide? Thank you. So the question is, but why, why do we look at these mirrors you know, when we're driving? So it seems quite obvious, but really when you think about it, I actually checked that we're supposed to um, check our rear or view or side mirrors every five to eight seconds. So that's that's many, many times on a trip, on a journey, because we know that we need to know what's happening going forward, but we also need to know what has what is behind us, what's the scene behind us. So to inform our journey. So for the exact same reason, we want to use UDL as a, a framework work or an approach to review our own learning design to evaluate it so that we can inform the next steps. And for this reason, it's extremely important to do these types of reviews or evaluations, not just at the end of a course when we cannot implement any change for that course because it's over, but we need to do it mid course or even at multiple points. And I'm going to just give you an example. If we can have the next slide at Ravensbourne, I lead a course which is called the Postgraduate Certificate in Education. It's actually a staff development course where um, basically I help teachers teach better, I hope. And um, I have used UDL um, as much as possible at the learning design stage well, when planning the course, which is now entirely online. But I wanted to know from the students, is it is it coming through? Is it, is it working? Is, is this PG cert um, itself, is it inclusive? So I used then this framework um, to do a review, a mid-course review or evaluation. And what you see there, that picture is actually a, um, a set. I've got it here. It's a felt. It's called Ketso. It's a felt with movable pieces different colors, different shapes, where you can represent any ideas, brainstorming, etc. So I asked the students to take some shapes um, to um, highlight the three UDL principles. Uh, these are the three mirrors and then add ideas around them as to what they thought, whether they were experiencing this. Uh, or how they were experiencing it on the PG cert. So, for example, representation, you know, the inputs that they were receiving. Did they feel it was inclusive? Did they feel they had options? Was there enough variety? Likewise, with action and expression. What about the assessment I was asking of, of them? Formal, informal, summative, formative, etc. What about the engagement? Now, interestingly, with the engagement, 
and because the students did this in groups and in breakout rooms and they, are, they have study sets and most of them actually mentioned Ketso, this very um, sort of a kit that they have as something that they found very engaging to use. Of course, if we didn't have Ketso, because they have it, each one of them have has a set, but if, um, yeah, if I didn't have it, I think I would have asked them to draw these ideas. So in the next slide, if we can go ahead, you can see that then I asked the students to uh, take pictures after doing this um, activity in breakout rooms, uh, they put together these ideas and then we uploaded the photo, they uploaded the photos onto a Padlet because I needed to see what each group, and then we discussed a little bit. So what, what each group suggested as well. So it wasn't just a review um, of what's happened in the past and a uh, closed chapter, it's quite the opposite. T I, I asked them, tell me where you think there are gaps. And they did. For example, one of the groups mentioned uh, that um, and they wanted some more debate. They found they found debates um, quite engaging, uh, but it's difficult to do online. Um, so I think I had tried to avoid them. <laughs> but anyway, so I I appreciated that point. So again, this is a one way of looking back to actually um, inform teaching ahead. So whatever they mentioned that they thought was not exactly right, wasn't happening, then I immediately um, adjusted and I let the students know. So if we do a mid-term or mid-course review or evaluation, we can then um, take that information on board, make the changes, let the students know, and that will really help them um, to to um, uh, to feel appreciated in this feedback that they provide. So um, if we can go ahead, um, just final thought. Now, what if you are already very inclusive in the way you design learning, which is great? What if you're already um, using UDL as as an as an approach to teaching and learning in, in your design? Well, what can we say? You can see this uh, uh, this this person is uh, polishing their side mirror. So we can always do slightly better. So maybe we can adjust those mirrors, we can check again, we can perhaps refresh our uh, understanding of UDL principles, discuss them with um, colleagues as well. And in that way, we can keep progressing in the way that we intentionally design inclusive learning, inclusive learning for our students. So thank you very much. I think my time is over, so I'm going to stop here. Um, I don't know if I forgot something I wanted to say, but uh, I think I've covered the main ideas. I think the last slide is just some references where you can see, um, yeah, just put some references about where to find out more about UDL, where to find out more about the Ketso, uh, which is a really lovely kit, and also a reference to my blog post about, um, oh, sorry, I made a mistake there. <laughs> it's supposed to be 360 degrees feedback for learning. Um, yeah, talking about getting feedback from multiple sources and the students are one of those sources. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> thank you very much, Verna. Excellent. There was a lot there um, and I just want to uh, show, show the audience <coughs> via the screen now where they can uh, input their questions. So if you click on the question and answer uh, lo logo uh, on your on your your screen, you should be able to see a space where you can input some questions. So um, I, we had a, com a comment um, from from one colleague here, Verna, and I, I thought I'd share this with you. A colleague you'll know where well, David Baum. Um, he, he said, when we are driving a car, what is currently behind us may at some stage be in front of us or alongside us. Our rear view mirror may show us our future as well as our past. I don't know if you totally. wanted to respond to that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I was wondering about this. Uh, thank you, David, for this comment. I, I, I was wondering about this metaphor because I like using metaphors. I think when you have that mental image, it, it can really help. And I thought, does it really fit? Um, and I thought it's true that um, uh, there are different features of <laughs> rear because yes, exactly the fact that those they don't stay there. Perhaps they overtake us, <laughs> so they go ahead of us. Um, so I think it can work in different ways. And also, I think another aspect is the fact that um, when we use those mirrors, 
our own vehicle or ourselves and not the center of attention. And I thought I like that, the fact that it's not us. Normally when you use a mirror is your own image, the rest mm. is just background. But this is really more about what's happening. To me, it's more about the process and uh, getting this feedback from other sources, yeah. Thank you, that's that's really interesting. Um, Verna, would you like to say a little bit more about um, the way in which colleagues that you're working with are using universal design for learning to address some of the issues around accessibility. Have you got any sort of good examples that you might share with us? Because we have we have a question about um, yes. some uh, how do you address accessibility for disabled students? And I thought perhaps if we could draw from you around the UDL mm. perspective, that would be helpful. Yes, so I, I must say that at Ravensbourne, I am probably, I would say, the driving force <laughs> behind UDL. I, I'm the one who's promoting it as much as possible and um, trying different things out and uh, trying to, and as you know, when you do something the first time, it's always a pilot. You need to then um, precisely get that uh, evaluation and uh, review it and try again and improve it. So, um, the colleagues who have experienced the PG cert, uh, they have all been exposed, let's say, to um, UDL more than others. And I think we now are at the stage that there are enough people quite interested in this framework to maybe make it a little bit more prominent and uh, use it perhaps with some sort of um, a bit more structured, let's say, learning design effort. For, from all of us. Um, in terms of actual disability, um, when we were on site, um, I noticed that actually, although we are art and design, which tend to be a very hands-on and sometimes very physical type of um, um, disciplines that we teach, uh, we, did, we did have quite a number of actually like disabled, even physically disabled students who, and I, I noticed um, many of our colleagues were, make, were going to great lengths to involve them as much as possible. First of all, which I think is always good practice, first of all, checking and not assuming what are their actual needs. So um, I've tried to do that, for example, with a pre-course questionnaire where I check with students what their needs are, um, even in terms of, uh, you know, perhaps neurodiversity or if they want to disclose, obviously, because it's a personal choice, um, but um, I think that one thing, that's one thing I've noticed that uh, staff were making a big effort to understand what the needs were before um, making, you know, taking actions or making changes that perhaps were not exactly what was needed. Thank you, that's really helpful. There was, there was a, a quick question about uh, Ketso and is it a physical resource? <clears throat> um, and Elle, Elle has responded to that and, and uh, I've, I've got a Ketso kit here as well. So it is a physical resource, uh, but it, you, you can replicate it, can't you, in a, in a similar, <clears throat> in a very similar vein. I mean, what, what was really useful there was you had examples of the way in which students were putting information together collecting information um, and, and considering different focuses so they could do that with paper I guess or or on the screen oh yes yes <clears throat> oh sorry I thought the question was just generic oh so maybe you mean Ketso in terms of students being able to use Ketso if if they are not physically able to do so um, in in our case yes I, I had checked with the students whether they were all okay with a, a physical kit where they have to move um, pieces how and they actually love it but I must say what's interesting in that slide where there was the Padlet actually one group that day decided not to use Ketso but they made themselves a little digital representation um, so it's not sort of compulsory, of course, it has to be something which is uh, suitable for the cohort and uh, also um, that the students feel comfortable with. And so I don't impose it. Um, I just uh, provided it as a possible tool. It's been received well, uh, but I suppose if it doesn't suit a certain student, they can, of course, find yeah other means such as drawing or maybe digitally representing the ideas. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've got two questions that have come in. I think it really useful. Um, so from a colleague um, and for most people, they've come in anonymously. I think that's probably an artifact of the system. Um, so I run the PG Cert at Aston and use a polling tool to get feedback at the end of each session and ensure I close the loop by responding to that within a day or two. We need to model good practice. 
Um, I think excellent. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good example, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and then from another colleague, uh, what 360 degree approaches have you used thought about for getting student feedback to inform inclusive practice and approaches? I guess building on the example that you already gave, which was the Ketso um, and, the, and the, pa the Padlet that you produced. Are there other examples of ways in which you've done that, Verna? Yes, sure. So I wrote um, a little blog just a while ago about this. So the idea of the 360 degree, it means um, that because normally what happens is how, how do you, so, okay, it depends who is the learner. Let's say that we as teachers in this case are talking about ourselves as the learner. We want feedback. We want to um, get, for example, evaluation or review of our teaching so that we can inform our practice. So how, how do we do this? So uh, Obviously, you can think about your own practice and try to guess what would be uh, the, the next step or an, an enhancement you could make. You can talk to colleagues, so that's another source. And you can check the literature, which would be a really good idea to find out what is being said at the moment, what the, the, you know, the discourse is around uh, uh, good teaching and learning. And you can also ask your learners so that you learners, for example. So you have this wide variety of feedback sources which can inform then your next steps. Um, in the case of, um, of the PG search right now with my students, um, obviously because we have to be careful with um, survey fatigue. Um, I've had many comments about that recently. So uh, um, yes, I think an, an end of lesson, um, even quick check um, in different ways, like it was mentioned, polling, etc., is a really good idea. Um, but also um, having because they tend to be very quick. Yeah. So in this case, for me, um, using Ketso was a really good checkpoint where we, and it was embedded in the lesson as a learning activity. And the reason I really like this is because I think that it also helps students um, develop their learning about learning, giving them a vocabulary, the tools to talk about their own learning. And this is useful for any course they will do it any time in their lives. Um, and another way is I also use the Google Sheets, um, sorry, Google uh, Forms. Um, I know that's a survey, but, but it was uh, sort of personal questions in terms of how they're experiencing different aspects of the course. The questions were very, very short and they could either just indicate with a number or they could write um, a comment. And um, actually that's been extremely useful for me. Um, you know, need all the students have filled it in. Uh, I think now because we are digital, yeah, we have to think about ways to, so we have to think about how many times and in which ways. Uh, but I would say in a term, we probably need at least a couple of times to get a little bit more substantial, meaningful feedback from the students. And then whatever the institution does at the end of the course or the term, that's also useful, of course, yeah. Thank Sorry, you very much. That. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> it's been a really, really good discussion, but I, I'm, I, I know that we have to move to, to our next yeah, presenter. Thank so, Maha, thank you very much, Verna. Excellent. Um, Maha, could I ask you to, um, to join us now, please? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, if you've been sitting all day, just as like I have taken it to just stretch so that you have some energy to listen in. I'm going to try to make this uh, presentation a little interactive. Um, and of course, you know, feel free to jump in or not. Um, I'm going to be using Slido, so you know how to use that. that, that um, so I'm Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo, and I'm also the co-founder of Virtually Connecting and Equity Unbound, which are open um, open spaces that focus a lot on equity and dialogue. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, to start off, this is uh, the greeting that says peace be upon you, and it works for morning and evening and any time of day. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. I think it's really important because these days that the answer to that is not always going to be the same. Um, if you prefer to follow along the slides on your own, I've got a short link for it. It's bit.ly slash CDE Bali. So the CDE is uppercase and the Bali is lowercase. Um, this is useful if you need to look at alternative text to images, because there's going to be a lot of images coming up uh, as part of the discussion. And of course, if you just want to keep the slides for later, um, it's a CC uh, license on the slide. 
So what does equity and dialogue look like? I think it's important to refer to what Linda was talking about earlier in terms of power. Who has access to the spaces for dialogue? Um, and so, for example, I forgot to turn off my video and I heard that turning off my video will have will give you better um, audio. Um, because Microsoft Teams, for some reason, doesn't work very well on Egyptian internet infrastructure, whereas other tools work better. So who has access to the spaces for dialogue? In what ways are they able to participate? So, for example, you all in the audience are able to view this session and ask questions via Q&A, but you can't speak directly to us as speakers, for example, because of the way this is set up. Other spaces would be set up differently. So if this was a class, I wouldn't want it to be like this. Um, the other thing is, in what ways are people comfortable to participate? So having access to a space doesn't necessarily mean that the modes of participation are what they are most comfortable with. So for example, uh, a lot of my students do not want to turn their video on, but they're happy to participate via audio. And then I have some students who have anxiety and they won't, they don't want to even participate via audio, but they're happy to participate via chat. Whereas other people, the chat for them is cumbersome or distracting and they prefer audio. And this is, goes back to a bit of what Verna was talking about in terms of UDL is the importance of offering students the variety of these choices. And it's not about sometimes making things chat and sometimes making things audio and sometimes making video important. It's about every time offering choices. I think this is one of the misunderstandings of, of UDL that um, people in my university have sometimes. They say, oh, well, this, this week everybody has to do this and then next week everybody has to do that. But it's more of what Verna was talking about is giving choices every step of the way, if possible, where it makes sense. So, I mean, if it's a writing course, you're not going to force people, you're not going to tell people they don't have to write. But if it's any other course, question whether you have to give everyone the exact same assessment or give everyone the exact same mode of everything. The other thing is about culture and whose culture dictates the way we approach dialogue. Um, a lot of times uh, in my institution, because it's an American institution, we assume a lot of things about dem democracy in the classroom and open dialogue and Socratic dialogue and all of that, but students are coming from a culture that's different. Um, and so when you don't prepare them for this kind of dialogue, they're not going to participate as much. And you're going to have very a lot of power and inequality in the classroom, power dynamics where some people are participating better than others or some people are considered to be more studious or more engaged than others, whereas others are just they're being silent, but that doesn't mean they're not learning. Um, and so thinking about things like cultures where permission is important, if there are some students who raise their hand to speak and wait for others to finish, whereas others interrupt and they think it's OK, this creates a dynamic in the classroom that you need to work with to make sure that, you know, people know whether interrupting is fine or whether typing in the chat while someone is speaking is all right or, you know, making sure nobody's offended by that. And then, of course, whose language is used. So in, my students get to participate in intercultural dialogue, and because it's intercultural dialogue from people all over the world, everyone speaks English. And it's important to recognize the power involved in that kind of dialogue. And also, of course, who's using jargon or lingo? So even if we're all, if we're all fluent in English, but are we fluent in the jargon of engineering or the jargon of whatever the conversation is happening? And for example, if you have mixed groups of students who are like first years and fourth year in one classroom, which does happen in the American system sometimes. Um, how are you addressing that kind of thing? And then a really important one is who has political power in the conversation? Who decides the time or timing, especially if you're doing something across time zones? I'm sure I know definitely in the US and Canada and Australia, there's a lot of students who are no longer in the same country and there are exams at times for people where you have students in Canada and China and the Middle East. And what time to set these exams so that they're at a time that everyone would normally be awake. I, I know people who are having exams at 3 a.m. here in Cairo uh, in their university in Canada, for example. And then who decides which features of a web conferencing tool are on or off? Who decides whether the, the automatic thing that happens when you get in is that your camera is on or off? Uh, who decides whether people are allowed to share their screen to vote on certain things and how does that kind of thing influence power dynamics and of course like who gets to choose the topics of the conversations is really important how much choice do students have 
Um, I'm a big fan of Nancy Fraser's model of social justice, and it's just a reminder that a lot of times when we talk about social justice, uh, although not happening today in this conversation, but a lot of times people talk about digital access and the economic aspects, but they don't always tackle the cultural and political aspects, and they don't always think about how some interventions can fix something on an ameliorative level, just fixing that problem, but don't have a transformative effect um, long term, right? A systemic effect. Um, and that sometimes things we try to do to promote social justice uh, might have a neutral effect. They don't make a huge difference or they can be negative for certain people. So one thing that you do for one group of people because it helps them might make it difficult for others. One example is doing synchronous learning via Zoom or something like that helps students who are less autonomous learners and can't work asynchronously, but it's not accessible to students who don't have good Internet at home or have young children around them and would have trouble participating that way. So the important thing, uh, and this also ties into what Verna was talking about, is, is parity of participation, is how much everyone who's included in your class has a voice about what happens in the class. And one way of doing that is getting feedback from them in the middle of semester. But another way is also to think about when we create spaces, who feels welcome in these spaces? Um, and who, ha who feels like they can access the choices that we give them even? And so I always show this image of equality versus equity. You've probably seen something similar to it, uh, but I like this example because of the apples rather than the baseball fields. Um, and you can see that the there's one group where the apples are not accessible to the shorter people, whereas the the and they each had equal, you know, the same amount of support. And then the second image, which is equity, has them at different levels of support so that they can all reach the apple. Um, but then not everyone wants an apple. That's the thing. And that's what Verna was talking about in terms of UDL and how do you provide choices? Maybe somebody wants an orange. And then the other one, which I think maybe uh, Elle will be talking about a little bit more, is that there's some invisible inequalities, such, such as disability, some disabilities, uh, neurodiversity. These are things that may not be obvious to us. Um, and instead of asking students to always be letting us know how we, they want us to accommodate them, it might be better to think about how do we create the environment that is hospitable to diverse students in the first place. And it's important to also think about this. Um, I love this Desmond Tutu quote. I'm not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want the full menu of rights. Like when we're talking to students about giving them choice, it's not only about giving them little bits and pieces of agency. Can we help students create their own menu? Can we partner with students so that they choose the ingredients of their learning? And obviously, if they've never been given those choices before, they need some support to get there. And we need to do everything in our courses with intentionally equitable hospitality. Uh, this is a term that we developed at Virtually Connecting. I'm going to go through it really quickly because I want to go into the interactive activity in a second. So it's all about recognizing that when you create a dialogue space, you are the host and you need to think about who you're listening to when you're setting it up. You need to be intentional because equity doesn't happen by coincidence. And you need to pay attention to all students. It's different than focusing on each student. So not just saying, oh, this is welcome to all. You need to think about who are the particular students you have and what do they need. So for the next few slides, I'm going to show you some metaphors, so also building on what Bruno is doing in terms of metaphors. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to look at this table and who has a seat. Uh, Shirley Shisholm, who was one of the first uh, African-American women, I think, to be in Congress or Senate, uh, and also I think was a presidential candidate. She said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Now think about what it means to bring students as partners and ask them to participate in deciding something and whether that table feels welcoming for them. And here's my question for this table over here. If you're seeing it, it looks like it's uh, maybe a wedding and a very formal event and there are round tables with seats on them. Would you feel comfortable bringing a folding chair to this table? So if you're able to participate via Slido, you can either go to slido.com and put in the code D109. Um, or if you can't, uh, you know, if you don't want to use the browser, if you have your phone, you can just use the QR code over here. And I see people are starting to vote, so I'll just pause for a second as people vote on this. I just did this activity with my students recently. So 
So my students mainly said uh, no and maybe. A couple of them said yes. They said yes if it was, um, for example, a wedding of someone from my family or my friends, then I would feel a little bit comfortable with that. So I'm going to, the majority of you are saying no, but there's a yes and there's some yeses and some maybe. I'm going to move on from this question for time sake because I want to show you some other ones, but there's going to be more on Slido, so please stay there for the next questions. What about this one? Would you feel comfortable with this one, bringing a folding chair to this one? So that one was an image of, um, just in case you hadn't seen it, lots of different chairs looking very different from each other. I wonder if some people are um, commenting on the previous one, so that's interesting because I'm getting a lot of no's as well. That's interesting. Okay. I was sort of thinking that because there's a lot of diversity in this set of uh, chairs, that bringing a folding chair won't be a misfit because so many of the others look different from each other anyway. So yeah, the yeses are increasing. I'm guessing they're my. Ma Maha, you have about, okay. yes. about two minutes. I know, one minute. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Two minutes. Okay, let's move on to this one. Um, this one, my students tend to feel is more relaxing. And I think one of them is because of the view, but one of them is also because there's some similarity between the people. They're not completely different from each other. And I think that's also important to think about. The diversity is not easy. Um, I mean, diversity is important and we want to promote diversity, but we need to realize that when we have diverse students, we need to work really hard to make it a harmonious classroom. It doesn't just become okay just because we made it diverse. Uh, so that's important to think about. Um, this is another thing that could be really comfortable for some cultures, but not for other cultures. So depending on who your students are, sitting and eating on the floor is not something that all people will feel comfortable with. Um, and this one is a campfire. A lot of people use the, the metaphor of campfire to describe a space that's really welcoming, but a lot of people wouldn't feel comfortable here. Um, I'm thinking of people who are autistic. I'm thinking of COVID times. That these people are so close to each other that it looks traumatic just to look at them. I'm thinking of people who are afraid of um, a fire or people who just don't like to sit with strangers, for example, very closely or afraid of the dark. Um, and this one, for example, again, I hear a lot of people talk about bars or pubs as a space that's uh, welcoming and alcoholics or younger than a drinking age or someone like me who's a Muslim or practicing Muslim, I wouldn't want to be there. Right? So it can be a space that's meant to be inclusive, but it ends up being exclusive to certain people. So the important thing I think that I'm trying to get at here is think about your learning spaces. And think about whether your learning spaces are welcoming for all people. Have I stopped sharing my screen? I hope I have. You have. Thank you. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Maha. That was really good. I think there was a little bit of delay for some people in terms of getting the Slido pictures and questions, but I thought the message was absolutely fantastic about that variety of different places in which we may or may not feel comfortable to bring our folding chair. A really powerful metaphor. So we've got, we've got some great metaphors today. Um, I'm going to ask Elle to go straight on and then pick up questions to both at the end, if I may, just in terms of recognising that people have, have earmarked an hour for this and I probably haven't managed the timing as well as I should have done because the, co the presentations are so fascinating. Thank you. Elle, over to you if that's OK. Hello everyone, nice to speak to you today. There are so many things I could talk about regarding inclusivity and online teaching, but today I'm going to specify and focus on neurodiversity. Next slide, please. Neurodiversity refers to the idea that we all have different brains and that neurotypical brains or so-called neurotypical brains aren't better than neurodivergent brains. And you may not be familiar with it. No, nope, thank you. And you may not be familiar with the idea of neurodiversity um, or the term, but you might have heard of conditions like autism or ADHD or dyslexia or Tourette's. And these are all conditions that fall under the umbrella of neurodiversity. Next slide, please. 
So we tend to design our teaching with an imagined or an implied student in mind, and that's based on who we are as learners and the learners that we've encountered before. And this makes sense, especially if we're doing student centred learning, where we're trying to think about who our student is and how we think they're going to respond to different things. Um, but the problem is that when we do that, that non-imagined students, so for example, neurodivergent students, um, amongst many other types of students, namely those that might be in marginalised groups, um, groups that don't have power, are often disadvantaged. Next slide, please. But now we're not making the choices that we might automatically make. We're not necessarily making the choices that would have been our absolute top thing to consider. And in doing so, we might be making some choices that are making things much harder for some people. We all know that there's a lot of challenges, but we may also be making some choices that without necessarily realising are making things better for some people. And sometimes that can impact neurodivergent students because um, I'm a neurodivergent person myself and our brains um, might just be responding in a way that you hadn't necessarily um, expected in response to, to learning. And so having this change can actually improve things for some people, but I'm not suggesting that all changes are better for all neurodivergent people. Everyone's different and it very much depends on the context. Next slide, please. So just a few examples of this. I could talk about this again forever, but do not worry, Linda, I will not. One thing is that fewer assumptions are being made. So I teach on our postgrad certificate and academic um, practice at the University of Glasgow, and this involves working a lot with new lecturers. And something that's coming up a lot is people saying, you know, I'm just having to, I'm really having to make things a lot clearer. I'm having to communicate with my students more. I'm having to say things that I thought would have just happened. So I, I just thought people would socialise or that community would build itself. Um, but now I'm having to be really explicit um, or people will say things like, oh, before I thought I knew whether people were engaging or not because I could see them. But now I don't. Of course, you never really did know to begin with, but you might have felt like you did. So these things being more explicit and clear is something that can be extremely helpful for neurodivergent people because um, we just don't always make the same assumptions that you might make. And so it's not that we can't do something, it's that it's, it's really helpful for lots of different people to be told explicitly what it is that's expected of you so that you can then go ahead and do your best to meet those expectations. Next slide, please. The next thing is that all this online learning, depending on how it's done, can allow for a lot of self-pacing, so learning at your own speed, and self-regulation. Next slide, please. Oh, good goodness, really? OK, well, there should have been one after that. Are you sure there wasn't in, one in between? No, there's not. Well, that's fine. I will just speak. I must have deleted it in all of the fun. So there's a few ways that this works. One is just about being yourself. So I find, and I've heard other people who are neurodivergent say this, that there's a lot of ways in which that we can do things that we've been trained not to do in a face-to-face -face environment. So this is often referred to as masking or camouflaging, and it's the idea that to be successful as, for example, an autistic person, you need to pretend as hard as you can to be not autistic. Um, and that's how a lot of treatment has focused in the past, seeing if you can act in a so-called normal way, which can be extremely damaging. It has a lot of negative outcomes, such as increased distress, um, a lot of exhaustion, a lot of lack of self-esteem, and actually, um, online learning can really help with that. So let's give some examples. One example is eye contact. Um, a very neurotypical thing is to assume that if someone isn't paying, um, giving you eye contact, that they're not paying attention. Um, so, and I even I find myself sometimes saying with kids, oh, hey, you know, look at me, but I try very hard not to do that because actually for a lot of people, they can't make eye contact and listen at the same time. So by asking someone to, make eye contact, you're literally saying, I would prefer that you look like you're listening than that you actually listen. And with online learning, what's great is that with these, um, the webcams and stuff, often people can't look at the camera and look at the screen at the same time. So 
it's normalizing people not making eye contact. Similarly, um, if I play with my fidget toy, hello, in meetings, people might look at me a bit strange, or if I'm working on my laptop, people might think that I'm trying to be disrespectful, but actually it's much easier to do that Right now I'm doing it below the screen, but you can't actually tell, which is very helpful. Um, I think something to keep in mind is that the way that um, students behave and in particular neurodivergent students, it might be different to what you expect, but that doesn't mean it's inherently disrespectful. So, for example, a student might be multitasking, a student might be really quiet or a student might be really vocal, a student might be eating a snack. All of these things might be actually their way of learning as best they can. But sometimes from a classroom management perspective, it can appear like that student is being disrespectful. So a lot of this is just about allowing students to be themselves. Um, so for a lot of people, fidgeting will help them learn better, be able to engage better and being able to engage via the chat, as has already been mentioned today, um, it can be very helpful for students who, for example, might I struggle with turn taking. I'm quite interrupty, so it's good for me to be able to type something because I know that people can engage with it in their own time. Another thing that's been pointed out, which I think is really useful, is that for students with um, hearing impairments, captioning can make things a lot easier. For students with hyperacusis, so who might find lots of noise very distressing, they can just turn their volume down. It's great to be able to make those choices. And in some situations you might think, well, couldn't they have made those choices face to face? Well, sometimes physically, technically, it's completely impossible. And sometimes, yes, but then it involves approaching people and being worried that you're going to be picked up on or reprimanded for doing something different when really maybe you didn't want to notice it. And the thing that I'd really like to say about this is that it really ties in with what Werner was saying about universal design for learning, which is a very helpful approach in considering all of this. And that's this idea that we're trying to be proactively inclusive as best we can. It's a process, not an end point, and it's not something we have to be perfect at straight away. But in trying to consider the idea that different people might engage with learning in different ways and that there isn't one best way to do it we are supporting people to be themselves and sometimes the best thing that we can really do for this is to try and create a approachable friendly positive environment where people feel safe safe enough to learn yes but more importantly safe enough to be themselves and safe enough to approach you if there's something that isn't necessarily working for them as um, as has also been said, it's not like there is one particular, you know, way of doing something that will work for everything. So people often do talk about having a mix of activities, but actually having that ability to engage in the way that works for you with every activity is great. But this can be really difficult from a facilitation perspective because, for example, with assessments, we might want to allow lots of different ways of demonstrating learning. But often from a bureaucratic point of view, that needs to be set up at the time that you're updating or creating a course through your local approval process. Um, so I think just to finish off, because I sense that I'm probably running out of time. I've got a nice smile there from from Linda. Um, happy to uh, discuss concrete tips further, but um, the point I really wanted to make here was that doing your well, doing your best is a difficult term, but trying to work with other people and trying to make an environment inclusive is a really great thing to do. And just checking in with people and not necessarily assuming that they're being disrespectful by maybe engaging with something differently is a great way to go about things. And I think that working online can actually facilitate a lot of really positive things, even if there are also negative things that can happen. Um, so thanks very much.
I'll just oh. have a little look at the questions. Oh, thank you very much. That was that was excellent. So we've had three really exciting inputs there, and thank you to to our three speakers. Um, we've got a variety of questions and comments in, in the panel. So if I if I can, I'll I'll bring those together. Um, so um, David has has asked the question. The view used to be, and and I'd like to address this to both El and Maha initially, and then I, I expect Werner might want to come in as well. But the view used to be that educational practices that are good for students with particular ability sets are usually better for all students. I'd love to have your views on this. El, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, sorry, my cat's joined us. I think that that's very much still the viewpoint because the idea is that, for example, um, anxiety is something that we all experience, but not all to a clinical level. So I think that there are various traits that people might have. They might not be diagnosed or they might not meet clinical requirements if it's regarding disability, but that actually can relate to everyone. So yes, I would I would say that in most cases that is, is, that, that is the case. Thank you, Maha. I'm, I'm going to agree. I'm going to agree and I want to give an example as well. Uh, recently I had a student who was in the car during class time. And so what was actually happening is that he was effectively blind for that time period when he was in the car. So if I was doing an activity that required him to look at the screen, at that time he needed someone to describe the images for him, for example. And so sometimes, even if you don't have a student who has a visible or, or obvious or ongoing disability in your class, there will be circumstantial uh, situations where someone is unable to participate fully in your class. And so it's always important to design with that in mind. And, and also, it, I think it's important not to require students to keep disclosing their disabilities in order for us to accommodate them, but to rather design our course extensively inclusive in those ways. Go ahead there now, I think you want to do something. Yeah. <laughs> Just just very briefly, yes, I, I totally agree. And also, I was thinking, for example, I was saying that, um, for example, when I produce worksheets or anything which is Word documents, PDFs, if I produce them myself, I'll always set the background either off white or pastel, you know, light blue, something like that. And I know that for many dyslexic students that really helps, but actually it's pleasant for everybody because I don't think we, we mind. I've never had a complaint from others, but you see, I just do that by default. So by default, I do it that way, and then hopefully it will be um, well received by those who actually really have got that particular need, but it will not disturb in any way the others, if, uh, quite the opposite. I think that's a, that's a really good example, Verna, of the what, what Elle was perhaps talking about in terms of the way digital ha and the pandemic has changed things, because now students would expect to get a digital document that they could control themselves as well, so they can they can change the background. So rather than the days when we printed things out and had to make sure we put different colour paper in the photocopier, I think it's it is quite empowering. Um, there's there's a comment um, that I'd like to share with you in in the question section. The affordances of the technology we've used during the pandemic have provided people with more choice, flexibility for participation, video, audio, chat, etc. As you've mentioned, how can we ensure? Uh, oh, sorry. How can we ensure we offer this flexibility for engagement if and when we go back to physical spaces? And I and I suspect that that is the challenge that all of us are are, are working our way through. So, would anybody on the on the panel like to contribute to that discussion? Oh. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a discussion, um, I think, at my institution about the idea of blended spaces. And I think it's about um, there being the the kind of physical spaces, uh, physical infrastructure that enables people to participate um, who are online, because as somebody disabled who works from home when they can, um, actually, I find online meetings are brilliant. Face to face meetings are OK, but the worst are the meetings where it's me at home and everyone else is in a room because there's just not the infrastructure for it. So I think that. In an ideal situation, we would have um, we would have infrastructure that facilitated that. However, not being in an ideal situation, I do think that there are things like having some sort of um, 
online chat stream, I think, could be helpful. I've seen that done before back in the past many years ago with something called text wall, which I don't know if it still exists. But I think something like that could be a helpful way of enabling that kind of flexibility. So that's that's got real implications, hasn't it, for the the structure of the buildings that are our universities or our learning spaces as, as much as anything. So build, building in that that technology. Um, Thank you. I know that but I some think people, Linda. Sorry, Matt, I'm just going to say. Sorry, okay. just one moment. I know that some people will have to leave because it is three o'clock. Um, just to say to the audience who have to leave, it's lovely to have had you with us. Thank you very much. We will, as always, post a report and a copy of the video and the resources on the CDE website and we'll make sure that you've got that. Our next event is happening on the 6th of May. We're taking a break in April and it's looking at institutional reflections. And so it really builds on from that question of how have the buildings got to change in part in order to take us forward but we can stay on here and continue with the conversation which is fascinating so thank you very much audience if you have to go if you can stay please do and continue to put questions in if you'd like to maha apologies for that <laughs> can i draw you back in no problem so uh yeah it's building on your points about how buildings need to change and I think we often think about these in the most expensive ways that are very resource intensive. And I'd like us to move away from that because it's a mindset of inclusion. There are manual, low cost ways of achieving what we're talking about here. And we just need to work with the resources we have and just imagine how to do them. You need to get the mindset, then you will find a way. Um, I, there's, including my own institution, a lot of people investing in a lot of technology, and that's not necessarily what's going to help you. Achieve the inclusion. That, think about really how can you make students mobile? How can you use that? And and don't think about the crazy expensive mics and cameras and and that bells and whistles. They're not. That's not what's going to create inclusion. There's actually a lot of people who have that technology, and still the students who aren't in the classroom aren't having an equitable say in what's happening in the classroom. It's a pedagogical question. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Can I just say something about technological affordance? I'd like to say that um, it's uh, interesting now that uh, obviously we don't know how long this uh, situation is going to go on for, but even without the pandemic, I think the genie is out and <laughs> about. <laughs> and I, I, I just can't imagine that we can uh, go back to exactly how things, well, I hope not <laughs> how they were before, because there are so many um, positive changes that have come out of this um, in terms of education I'm talking about. So, for example, I was thinking about in terms of VLEs, um, there are many institutions that, you know, regularly review um, what type of platforms they use. And um, I think now talking about affordances, you know, what what can a platform do? How easy it is to create a community within that platform? How easy is a student to student interaction, which is not teacher generated or teacher, you know, actually started by the teachers. You know, th these questions, I think, will actually drive a different demand for platforms that can actually uh, uh, give us that flexibility. Uh, although, as Maha was saying, you can achieve it in so many different ways. But I mean, even in terms of the VLEs, um, I think now there are different uh, expectations of what platforms can actually do. Yeah. Thanks, Rana. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, Adam from Aston has put a comment and uh, from, uh, this is particularly true for me as a person with dyslexia and two screens and chat panels and a WhatsApp group as well all happening at the same time. It's this kind of he, he's he's talking about hybrid teaching in person and online um, and I'm just dealing with online at the moment and my brain the cognitive overload <laughs> is massive in my brain now trying to manage time as well. So. I think this is, uh, you know, these are challenges that we're all going to face, I suspect, as, as we go forward, as we go back into into physical spaces with our students. Um, and I suspect it's going to be really important to, to, to pick up on some of the things, Maha, that I, I really got from your talk about um, that some of the students might just need some care, that actually they don't need the apple, they just they kind of need a metaphorical or a real hug um, at that point. And I think that all the time with my students who are themselves teachers, you can see that their need of a hug um, as much as as I myself do. So I think these are these are really profoundly important uh, uh, areas that we've picked up on. We probably have to start to close down now. It's been um, an excellent input and I think 
I suspect um, the presenters would uh, appreciate a round of applause, but we can't quite do much. But I'm very happy to um, to give you a good way for for a fantastic session, really, really fantastic session. Um, and to say that we'd hope to see you at the next of these events in, in May, if, if you'd like to join us, please do keep in dialogue with us. We, you know, we've got our Twitter feed, we've got our website, we've got our, our mailing list, um, CD, Centre for Distance Education at the University of London, our colleagues at Goldsmith University and, and our colleagues in Paris at ULIP, University of London Institute in Paris, are all very eager for dialogue around, around this webinar series. And we hope to keep it going next year because we suspect it's going to be another year of, of learning and digital experience learning. So um, it's very nice that people are putting thank yous and comments in the in the, the comment section, question and answer. So thank you to our technical team as well, Andrew and Mark behind the scenes and Kim in Paris and, and to our presenters. We look forward to seeing you again.